The most extreme example of that, the kind of clearest example, is what took place after the 20-man crash in the Great Depression in the US, where the working class was literally decimated, and there was a very low level of struggle for a number of years. However, you then had significant battles taking place, including the Teamsters led by Trotskyists, and out of that, you had the mass car occupations and so on that Mark, Mike Forster raised earlier. Now, that came directly from the recession and led to an enormous politicisation, but it took a while for workers to get the confidence to struggle. Having said that, that is not the most likely scenario for Britain. Thankfully, we would say that even in the US, the kind of catastrophic collapse that happened in the Great Depression is not necessarily going to happen, and it's certainly not the most likely for the British economy at this point in time, although of course it can't in any sense be ruled out. And it's probable that we will see moves towards struggles much more quickly on the basis of economic, uh, de economic uh, developments in Britain. And of course, how the working class responds to crisis doesn't just come from the nature of the recession, it also comes from everything that's gone before, of what workers have experienced over the last few years. And for the last 15 years, yes, we've seen economic growth, but it really has been a joyless boom for the majority of the working class. Peter gave a figure earlier about the number of workers in America who think the gap between rich and poor has got too big. But in Britain, it's more than 80% of the population think that the gap between rich and poor has got too big. And it's no wonder. Even as the banking crisis began to hit at the end of last year, the City of London took home the biggest bonuses they ever had. More than £26 billion that they took in bonuses. It really is fiddling while Rome burns, and of course, it's a fire that they themselves in the city of London, in a certain sense, lit. And that doesn't go unnoticed by working class people, particularly against the, anger, against the background of wage stagnation, etc., and all of the things that the working class has suffered. It's a reflection of the degree of anger that exists, the new Labour were actually forced to talk about taxing the non-doms. Of course, they immediately retreated from actually doing it and went on to appoint a non-dom as head of Northern Rock just to put the tin hat on it. But even for them to talk about it was a reflection of the anger that exists. As is the fact that they've been had to make pathetic little noises about possibly imposing a windfall tax if the nice, nice uh, gas companies don't hand them a little bit of money uh, on, the, uh, on the question of the huge profits being made by British gas and so on at the same time as domestic fuel prices rocket. And there's no doubt one of the consequences of the boom of the last 15 years is a real bitter class hatred underlying the other moves that exist in society. It's not come to the surface, partly from a lack of confidence, and partly because the role of credit has enabled workers to get by even when they're not very well paid. But at a certain point, the capitalist class is going to pay for everything that they've done over the last 15 years. Another aspect of consciousness as a result of what's taking place is the undermining of kind of all the institutions of the capitalist state. And that's a general thing, but it's most marked when it comes to the capitalist politicians. It's normal now for people to see the working class in particular, all of the capitalist politicians, as a bunch of liars, the sleaze, all the rest of it. But that wouldn't have been the case in the past to the degree that it is today. It's as a result of the experience over the last 15 years, which means they have very limited authority to try and uh, force uh, the working class down uh, the road they want to force uh, down the road they want to force it to. So that's one side of it. And all of that baggage will mean that a recession or slowdown will have explosive consequences amongst the working class in Britain. But of course the other side of it is the weakness, relatively, of class organisation. And by that, I mean the question of the lack of a political alternative for the working class. The fact that there is no independent mass party of the working class, or even as yet significant steps towards it. And this is for us an absolutely critical <coughs> issue. Of course, we would fight for any new party of the working class to adopt a socialist programme, to adopt our programme. But we recognise that would not necessarily be the case in the first stages. But the point for us, is if it brought together the different workers involved in, the, in campaigns and struggles around the country, if it gave them a voice, 
but it also gave them an opportunity to debate and discuss with each other on what is the best program to serve the interests of the working class, then that would be an enormous step forward. So that's one issue, and I'll make some more points on that later on. But another side of it is the question of the relative weakness of the trade unions. Now, we mustn't exaggerate. There are more than six million workers who are members of the trade unions in Britain today. They are potentially an enormously powerful force, by far the biggest working class organisation that exists in Britain. But nonetheless, we would have to recognise that the majority of young people working in the service sector, in call centres and so on, are not only not in trade unions, but don't at this stage have a trade union consciousness. They wouldn't necessarily automatically look to the trade unions in order to lead struggle. And at the same time, those workers who are organised, and that's concentrated in the public sector, but also in important parts of the private sector as well, are at this point only active in the structures of the trade unions to a limited extent. This is related to what we've called repeatedly proxy consciousness, or sometimes gets called poxy consciousness, because it's quite a frustrating <laughs> phenomenon. Um, but the idea of proxy consciousness, that at this point in time, there are many workers who would vote for socialists to elect them as their local trade union rep, who would back anybody who fights for them to the hilt, would come and give us two pounds when we're collecting on a street stall, but are not necessarily active themselves. They're looking to somebody else to do it for them at this point in time. And our experience is even where we're leading struggles in the trade unions, while it's true that during those struggles, workers will flood into the structures, will take part in that struggle, once the immediate issue has died away, they don't necessarily stay active and become new stewards to the degree which would have been the case in the past and will certainly be the case in the future. Now that will change on the basis of bigger struggles than we've seen so far. And actually it could already be beginning to, and we were talking on a very small scale here, but it is noticeable that our party has had some victories, has led some community campaigns and trade union campaigns that have resulted in victories in the course of the last six months. Whether it's the dinner ladies in Walton Forest, the housing ballot in New, in, uh, which, in New Cross, which as Clyde is summing up on this discussion, you will certainly get to hear a little bit uh, more about Bristol, the stopping of the library closing, uh, Youth Club, I believe, in Hull, and so on. But those victories, and the fact that they have generally mobilised actively a layer of workers beyond ourselves, are a little straw in the wind about how things can change in the coming period. And of course, where unions have a fighting leadership nationally, it's a much healthier picture. The PCS, as we say in the documents, have got something like 3,000 extra stewards as a result of the struggles they've led over the past few years. But even now, it's a relatively thin layer compared with what we had in the past and what we will certainly have in the future. And then, of course, unions with fighting leaderships are clearly an exception at this point in time. PCS, the RMT, the Prison Officers Association, and perhaps one or two others. But generally speaking, including those that were elected as a supposed awkward squad, have capitulated entirely to new Labour and to big business. And they're prostrating themselves, actually, before this new Labour government. It's always been the case that the tops of the trade unions, when there's a Labour government, try to hold back struggle in order to, as they see it, protect the Labour government. However, this is a capitalist Labour government. And the new trade union leaders are doing it to a greater degree than they have ever done it before in their pathetic crawling before this government with the neoliberal policies that it's carrying out. Now, the fact we've been able to get away with that is partly because the structures are relatively empty at this point in time. If you look back to the 70s and the Callaghan government, there was a much bigger, a mass shop stewards movement that existed at that point in time which does not yet exist today. And we go beyond that and say, actually, there's a line of left activists, or supposedly left activists, who, for a whole period through the 1990s, did continue to fight against Kurt's privatisation in defence of their members, and in the last few years have capitulated, and acting as bag carriers for the right wing, rather than continuing to fight, uh, continuing to fight for their membership. 